Hi, today we're going to talk about signals and noise and how we process signals to get rid of noise. So first of all, let's look at an operational definition of noise. When you get data, you expect to get a nice clear signal that tells you exactly where you are measuring things. But in reality, there is no nice clear signal. There's a lot of fluctuation, as you can see in this picture. And we tend to separate noise into two different types of noise, chemical noise and instrumental noise. So you have previously watched a couple of videos about thermal noise and shot noise. So I will kind of gloss over those, go through them quickly. Everything else I want to talk about in a little more detail. First of all, what in the world is chemical noise? Well, when you're doing a chemical analysis, you can have fluctuations in the concentration of your analyte, or they could be fluctuations that are actually caused in chemical changes in your analyte. So for example, you could have something that's exposed to oxygen and so it oxidizes over time. And so you might get different qualitative information if you're stirring your flask, so for example, if you're doing a potentiometric titration and you stir your flask as you add the base to your acid, you don't always have consistent pH. So depending on where and when you're measuring, you may see fluctuations in the pH going up and down. All right, thermal noise, you've watched a video on, and basically this is where you get electrical components that generate heat, usually resistors, and that heat causes random thermal motion of electrons. Now, importantly, the heat within an instrument is going to change over time. So in general, instruments get hotter the longer they run. And so your thermal noise, if you're not careful, could get larger and larger as time goes on. Next up, we have environmental noise. Environmental noise is basically some sort of signal that's being picked up by your instrument that does not originate within your instrument. And I put a picture of the very large array, which is a radio telescope array in New Mexico, because this can sometimes happen when part of your instrument can serve as a radio receiver. So if you have a long length of wire, that can turn into a radio antenna. So the reason I put the VLA here is because there was an interesting phenomenon that people observed at the VLA where there was a sudden microwave signal coming in and it was very brief and unpredictable and was not coming from a particular part of the sky and they couldn't figure out what it was. And then it turned out whatever the dwelling there is where the scientists live, there was a microwave in there. And now microwaves are generally shielded so no microwave energy gets out. But what would happen is every once in a while, someone would see that their food was hot, even though the microwave was still going and they'd open the door, the microwave automatically shuts off, but not immediately. For just a fraction of a second, the microwave is still going and microwave radiation was leaking out. And this would actually register on the VLA as some sort of microwave emission. So that's a good example of environmental noise. Um, but you could just also be picking up radio noise on various wires and that could contribute to random fluctuations in your signal. Shot noise, again, is something that I gave you a very detailed video to watch and I think it explains it a lot better than I can. But basically, you expect to see shot noise when you're counting single events. So if you have a uh, photomultiplier tube, which is something we're going to talk about when we talk about detectors in optical spectroscopy. Um, or if you're talking about very, very, very low concentrations of molecules going through a mass spectrometer, things like that, you can get shot noise. These are random. There's nothing you can do to design it out of your instrument. You can try and compensate, as the video talked about, but you know you can never completely escape it. So now what I really want to get to in this video is to talk about noise problems, i.e. defining what is a peak and what is noise.
So if you look at any sort of spectrum, a lot of times what you're looking for is a peak, whether that's a peak in absorption, a peak in emission, or something like that. You'll understand this a little better once we actually start talking about spectrometry. But as you can see here, here we have a spectrum, and it has some things that look like peaks, and then it has a lot of noise in what we call the baseline. The baseline is what you get when you run a completely blank sample through. Okay, so if you look right here between 51 and 55, are any of these peaks or are they just noise? You could say, I think it's clear that this thing here is a peak, but what about the thing to its immediate left? Is that a peak or is that just extra loud noise? So we need to be able to figure out what is a peak and what is not a peak. A peak would be where we're actually getting signal and not just noise. To determine this, we like to look at the signal to noise ratio. So what does that mean? First of all, it's going to be a measure of analytical signal. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a numerical quantity for our signal and divide it by a numerical quantity for our noise. Now you might say, how the heck do you do that? Well, for our signal, what we can use is we can use the average value of what we think is data, and we can divide by our standard deviation. So we usually do this for one particular peak. We're doing one peak at a time, so we're going to look at the average value of the signal for that one particular peak, but we're also going to look at the fluctuations for that peak. If you've done even the most basic statistics, you will see that this is very closely related to the relative standard deviation. In particular, it is the inverse of the relative standard deviation, because the relative standard deviation is basically your standard deviation divided by your average. Right? Now, if you get a large value of signal to noise, what that means is the signal is so small, it's completely indistinguishable from the noise. So we're generally looking for a signal to noise ratio that's above three. Uh, some people might go down to two. I don't really trust those people's data. So one of the things it's useful to do is to see if we could go through, analyze our data, and get rid of noise. So there are two ways we can do this. We can do this by making changes to our instrument, and we're going to call that analog processing. And then we can just do what we call post-processing, where we're taking the data and we are in some way applying mathematics to it to smooth out the signal. So we're going to go through specific examples. But let's first talk about analog processing, where we're actually adjusting our instrument. So one of the things we can do is to block particular frequencies. This is something that astronomers try to do if they're at an observatory that is close to a major city. There's a lot of light pollution that comes in from cities. And for many, many years, astronomers encouraged people to use sodium vapor streetlights. And the reason they did that is because sodium vapor streetlights emit in very narrow bandwidth in the orange. And so they could take an orange filter and basically cut out all the orange light that was entering their telescopes, and that way they could reduce the amount of light noise that was entering their telescope from Earth and get a stronger signal from what was coming in from space. So we can also do this with other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, of course. It does not have to be visible light. You can think about this in terms of your car radio, where you're only picking up a particular frequency of radio waves and not anything to either side. The other way we can eliminate noise in an analog fashion is to use what we call a blank. And so we've talked a bit about blanks and what they are, but essentially what you're doing is you're looking at what your baseline should be. Remember I said that baseline was what you measure when you don't run any analyte through. So you take that and then you're going to subtract it from your signal. So now we're going to talk about some other noise reduction techniques which are applied 
in post-processing. So these will be done often by your computer software. So the first is signal averaging, where you look at your baseline and your averaging signals from several consecutive measurements with the idea that any time you get a fluctuation up, that's going to cancel some fluctuations down. Now, there's several ways that we do signal averaging. So this is useful when you expect that the noise will be fluctuating up and down over time, when you're going to get certain shapes of signals, when your noise is not related to whatever it is you're trying to read. Now, there are multiple ways you can do signal averaging, and we're going to look at a couple of them here. The first one is called boxcar filtering. And essentially what you're going to do is you're going to chop your data into equally spaced segments. And those are what we call your boxcars. It's like you're drawing a box around those segments. And you're going to calculate an average signal for each segment. A lot of software, if it does boxcar filtering, you can set how large those segments are. What you're going to do then is take those average signals and you're going to draw a curve through it and that's going to be your final signal. So here's an example of something that might come out in a spectrum that's pretty noisy as you can see. And basically the boxcar technique is basically to say, okay, let's chop this into segments and let's say each segment has three data points. Okay, so there's a segment with three data points. We're going to take the average of that. Then there's another segment with three data points. We're going to take the average of that. Here's another segment with three data points. We're going to take the average of that and so on and so on all the way through the spectrum. So what that's going to end up looking like is this. So if you look down here in the lower left, you can see how the red points correspond to roughly the average of what's in the box. And when we take away the original spectrum, what we get is this. And you can see that if you draw a curve through that, it's going to be a lot less noisy than the original spectrum. Another signal averaging technique is what we call a three or five point rolling average. Now, just to say, and I'm going to come back to this later, you don't have to use three points or five points. That tends to be what instrument software does, but you could plug in any number there to do your rolling average. And we'll talk about that again at the end. So basically what you're doing is you're making your curve of averages. So the first point on your curve is going to be the average of your, if you're doing three point rolling average, the first three points, points one to three, if you're doing five point averages, that would be one to five. And you might say, isn't this like boxcar smoothing? Well, no, because boxcar would do one and three, and the next that would be four to six, et cetera, et cetera. But the second point is going to be two to four. So that overlaps with the previous set of points. Or if you're doing five point rolling average, it would be two to six. And you're just going to keep on going. So instead of doing boxcars that are all placed out at the beginning and don't overlap, you're going to have sort of these rolling boxes that you're taking averages of. So here's that same spectrum again. Here I'm showing a box that includes five points. There would be the next five points. There would be the next five points. So that's, that is very different from how we were doing boxcar averaging before. Here is a three point rolling average where I'm doing it the average of every three data points. Here's the five point rolling average. And I'm just going to quick remove the original spectrum so you can see the difference. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to this spot down here. And you can see that there are some wiggles in the data, which may or may not be a small peak. We'd have to look at the signal to noise ratio that get pretty much wiped out with a five point rolling average that don't get wiped out with a three point rolling average. So in general, the larger the number you put in for how many points you're going to do in your rolling average, the smoother your curve will be, but also the more likely you are to miss out on things which are just at the limit of detectability. Now, here's a place where you tend to see rolling averages used a lot, and that is in the stock market. So in this particular chart that I nabbed online, 
we have the 20 day moving average in blue. We have the 100 day moving average in red. You can see here all these red and blood black boxes showed where the stock was selling throughout the course of a particular day. And you can see if you look at the blue line that it pretty well parallels what's happening. But then the red line gets rid of a lot of that up and down and just shows a gradual upward trend, right? So that gives you an idea of why we would use one set of moving averages over another to look for larger trends or for smaller trends. So our last technique is what we call polynomial least squares smoothing. And that's essentially, you're going to take your signal, you're going to divide it into segments. So that is something that happens in any of these software smoothing methods. And then you're going to try and fit each segment to a linear curve and a quadratic curve and figure out which of those has the best fit. And then you're going to keep doing that for all the other segments and hopefully come out with a nice smooth curve. So let's take a look at our spectrum again. And we're going to do this by zooming in on these points right here. There's eight points in this particular box. So here are our eight points and you can do a linear fit and you can see there's a lot of scatter. So it's not a perfect line. And then you can also try doing a quadratic fit, right? And that maybe might be a little better. I mean, obviously I'm not throwing the R squared on here. There's also a method for measuring how good a quadratic fit is, which is not R squared. And then you have to compare those, right? And see which one is better. And then you're going to have to repeat that for each segment. You're going to have to say, is this more linear? Or is this more quadratic? So a lot of times you have to ask yourself which noise reduction technique should be used. Here is an example of a peak that looks like something that might have come out of my flow injection analysis chemiluminescence detector. I use this to measure hydrogen peroxide. And when you're measuring this, you're measuring a constant flow of stuff going through. When I was out at sea one time, actually a couple of times, I saw something that looked like this. Now, remember this thing is set up to detect photons. It's a luminescence detector, as I said. Well, what had happened in all of these cases is we were going through areas that contained bioluminescent creatures. And when you see that huge spike in the peak, what was happening was as your analyte flowed through, all of a sudden you had this luminescent critter in front of the PMT and there was this huge spike and then, you know, we went back to analyzing things the way that we normally do. So what noise reduction technique would you use in this case? I'm not going to answer that question. It's one of the reading questions for this week. And so we're going to talk about this in class and see what people come up with. So as you can see, each of these signal processing methods will end up with a slightly different result. So there's probably a best way to process any one particular sort of signal, but you always have to keep in mind that by averaging in some way or another, you are also leaving out information. And so choosing a method for signal processing isn't just optimizing what your data looks like, it's also analyzing whether or not you're getting rid of some interesting outliers that might actually mean something. I hope this was helpful and I hope to see you again soon.